Staying fit and healthy is as important today as it's ever been. Today we're all about smartwatches and fitness trackers and living a healthier life with wearables. If you need that little extra motivational push, get in gear for shift. Oftentimes the sleeker and more comfortable alternative to clip-on heart rate trackers is the smartwatch. For many, they are a lifestyle product, but in the medical world they have the potential to be a lot more than just that. How well do they work and do medical experts take them seriously? We got the chance to meet someone with first-hand experience, Sasha Nivelle, whose smartwatch might have just saved his life. Sasha Nivelle's smartwatch went above and beyond recently. It prevented a possible stroke. He was using it mainly for sports. When it noticed irregularities in his heartbeat, Nivelle knew to act. But when he visited the doctor, he was given the all clear. I went to the cardiologist, who performed a long-term ECG, but didn't find anything. I thought it was an error, so I switched off the alarm because it was kind of annoying. That could have had serious consequences for the 48-year-old, because the smartwatch was right. A second ECG at Bonn University Hospital confirmed what the gadget had picked up. The standard ECG then revealed that I have something called atrial fibrillation. I was asked several times in the cardiology department why my watch hadn't sounded the alarm. And so I had to tell them again and again that I had actually disabled the alarm myself. Sebastian Zimmer, a cardiologist at the University Hospital in Bonn, has had good experiences with smartwatch health apps. He's convinced the potential is huge, especially for prevention. The data that these smartwatches collect, the, the ECG reading, they are very reliable. The most common uh, heart rhythm disorder, arrhythmia, is called atrial fibrillation, and it's the leading cause of stroke worldwide. And um, this can be detected by smartwatches, and then if we know that a patient has it, we can initiate treatment to prevent stroke. Sasha Nivelle has been in treatment ever since, and now wears his smartwatch regularly. Which was a pretty good idea, his heart started playing up again, and the app was the first to notice. It signaled reliably every time. You're having atrial fibrillation again right now. Maybe you should contact your doctors. Apps and smartwatches can't replace a doctor, but they can certainly help by gathering valuable data. Especially when it comes to cardiovascular diseases, which cause over 18 million deaths a year globally. Wearables and AI can also help reduce risks by motivating us to eat healthy or exercise regularly too. I certainly don't do this all that often. Do you? AI assistants can ease our day-to-day. -day. Take the AI pin, for example, a smart mini-computer. It answers messages, sends you reminders, takes photos, plays music and more. Keeping your heart healthy could be so easy. But let's face it, it's not, is it? But maybe AI can help. How much protein? A half a cup of almonds has 15 grams of protein. Soon, this AI will be able to scan food and list its nutrients, useful for those looking to live a healthier life. Getting information on what you eat is incredibly important because most people aren't aware of what they eat on a regular basis. They, they had breakfast two hours ago and perhaps didn't realize how many calories are in that muffin or in the pancakes that they consumed. And then if they get an update on a regular basis throughout the day, I'm sure that this will make them more aware of their lifestyle choices. There are many ways to find out what constitutes a healthy diet. I'm gonna eat it. Enjoy it. But does talking to AI really make a difference? The AI pin, for one, is hands-free, no smartphone required. The main restriction for our patients today is that the smartphones, etc., they are available, but the interactions with our surroundings and the devices to record this is limited. 
AI devices can warn users when food is overly unhealthy or contains allergens. And in future, it could follow what you're consuming and keep track of nutrients. You have had 22 grams of protein today. But how effective it will be is still unclear. At Bonn University's Hospital Cardiac Center, patients with calcified heart valves are admitted every day. It's not only a consequence of agent genetics, but also of poor nutrition or little exercise. Without treatment, the consequences of the illness can be fatal. AI is becoming increasingly important for prevention. For example, implanted defibrillators transmit data to the clinic daily. If there are any abnormalities, the AI sounds the alarm. AI-supported data on nutrition and health helps too. The interaction between a patient and a physician will become more intimate because we get more data available and we, the choices, that are, our recommendations that we give to the patient can be based on a larger data set. But as with all applications of this kind, data protection is a concern. Manufacturers assure consumers that nothing is recorded unintentionally and that data isn't sold to third parties. But the fact that data is often stored in the cloud is worrying because it could fall into the wrong hands. So, if you're looking to use AI assistance, make sure to consider the data you're putting out there. Thinking about data security, you have to weigh up how much it really benefits you. It's one of the reasons I switched it off back then. If it doesn't help me, I'll leave it alone. Let's assume you're wearing a smartwatch. How does it actually measure your heart rate? There are two different methods. Optical pulse measurement with light and a heart rate sensor that records electrical activity. More on that now. When it comes to accurate heart rate monitoring, we always recommend the classic chest straps. It's an electrophysiological recording. They essentially detect the heartbeats electrically, so they get a direct recording of the heartbeat. But the problem with these, of course, is that you can't wear it all day or all week. Smartwatches, on the other hand, are much more comfortable. The heartbeat is detected via optical sensor, which emits a light signal to measure the pulse wave. But it's not quite as accurate. The light is then absorbed by hemoglobin, a component of the blood from which we can derive the heart rate. But as it's a light source, everything that can interfere with light has an influence on the data quality. Things like skin color, body hair, tattoos, or perhaps scar tissue. Smartwatches don't work as well for people of color. That's why a team at Google is experimenting with ultrasound, which would pick up the heartbeat in the ear via headphones, irrespective of skin color, light reflections or strong movement. Besides heart rate, conventional variables often record heart acceleration. Other values like calorie consumption or blood oxygen levels are calculated using algorithms. Exactly how they work, though, is a trade secret. But in the end, the user only gets the results. So you can't tell if it's actually high-quality measurements or how much has been calculated. We know that these devices can do wonders for motivation. For example, when swimming goggles remind me of my training program. But the wearables can also provide detailed patient data for doctors with a clear edge when it comes to convenience and price. A milestone for heart patients. In the best case scenario, wearables can detect illnesses at an early stage. In future, this obtained health data could be used to model digital twins of patients' organs. Virtual models of a patient's lungs or heart, for example. But to deliver realistic values, they must first be fed with patient data. A children's hospital in Boston is at the forefront. The digital twin of a human heart. Thanks to this technology, the effects of different treatments can be tested without having to operate. Surgery on children's hearts is considered extremely risky. Boston's Children's Hospital is spearheading the use of digital twins to develop treatment plans, specifically tailored to each child. At the forefront is Dr. Steve Levine. He developed the first digital twin of a human heart. 
If they're creating virtual twins of the children, some as early as newborn, and performing the surgeries on the virtual twin first, deciding up front what is best, and then trying it out on the child. And in many cases, they only have one shot to save the child's life, and the results have been spectacular. Dr. Steve Levine started researching for the Living Heart Project around 10 years ago for very personal reasons. His daughter Jessie suffered from a rare heart defect and had to undergo several operations as a child, not all of which were equally successful. She is now benefiting from the research, because now pacemakers' optimal settings can be tested in advance and in virtual reality. They can actually insert the pacemaker, they can replicate her condition or thousands like her, try different pacing sequences on thousands of different versions of, of their heart to figure out which sequence would work out best, and then try it out and confirm on her rather than experiment directly on her. The findings can then immediately be transferred to other heart patients. Virtual therapy tests for individual organs are just the beginning, though. In future, everyone will have a digital twin at their side with a personalized health plan. I think what will happen is you will get a virtual twin, which is a generic version of a human, when you're born. It'll be quickly adapted to what we know about you at that point. And then as you get older, and you get more diagnostics, more tests, it gets tuned. It might be some time before we all have a digital twin of ourselves, but until then, wearables and AI assistants can help us stay fit and healthy for longer, provided, of course, that we actually take their advice and work out every now and then. That's all for me. Bye and see you next time. Mm -hmm.